Game deals with equilibrium. It's kind of a neat little chapter. Um, and everything else in the course, all the way up until we, at least until we get to nuclear and organic, <coughs> will build on this or, or will relate back to it in some way. As always, credit should be given to Brown and LeMay's chemistry and their uh, PowerPoints and also uh, Zumdahl's chemistry and their PowerPoints. Uh, commentary is provided by the author, and let's go ahead and move on. I think we're going to move a couple of slides now, uh, so you can read this if you want, and this, let's move on. So for Chapter 15, we're talking about equilibrium primarily. Uh, that's by far the main topic. So we'll look at how to do these equilibria expressions. Also, we'll look at the relationship between Kc and Kp. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to discover that there are different kinds of constants, of which there are a bunch of them. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the next few chapters. Uh, and the reaction quotient, which is kind of like the equilibrium constant, but it doesn't happen at equilibrium. And that's abbreviated with a Q. We'll talk about all this. And then solving equilibrium problems in Le Chatelier's principle. Next slide. So equilibrium is what everything is constantly striving for in the universe. So uh, for our purposes, it's the state where the concentration of reactants and products remain constant. So <clears throat> whenever you have a situation where everything is at equilibrium, then if you mess it up by putting something else into it, and that's what is happening all the time in our atmosphere and all that, is that things come to equilibrium as much as they can, but then they keep getting messed up by things coming in from outside. So when you have equilibrium, you have concentrations that are constant, but that doesn't mean that there's no activity. And you can see that on the next slide, I think. But what it means is that uh, the concentrations are constant, but uh, some product will be going to reactant, and some reactant will be going to product, but it's just that they're both going at the same rate. So it appears you know, from our level, <clears throat> looking down at it from uh, a larger like scale, is it, it looks to us as if it's at equilibrium when actually it, it, it is at equilibrium, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any activity going on. <clears throat> Next slide. So the equilibrium expression for an equilibrium is the main topic of this chapter. Let's look at it on the next slide. So we have a reaction here, which is like what we studied in chapter 14, except that in chapter 14, we basically used arrows that point in one direction. Let me get my marker working. So here you see <clears throat> this arrow is pointing in both directions. In other words, it's saying that this is what we call a reversible reaction. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned in chapter 14, this is actually, uh, this is uh, 13, because these were taken from some dull slides. Uh, so that chapter 13 in Zumdahl would be the same as chapter 15 in Brennan and LeMay. So don't let that confuse you. We're in chapter 15 in Brennan and LeMay. Uh, so in chapter 14, I mentioned that a lot of the reactions that we were dealing with in chapter 14 could actually be written as reversible reactions. It's just that uh, a lot of them <clears throat> tended to go primarily in one direction, but that doesn't mean that it only goes in one direction. In fact, almost all reactions, with it, maybe just a few exceptions, go only in one direct. Uh, go. I'm sorry. Go in both directions. So <clears throat> there's only a few that only go in one direction. Uh, <clears throat> and even those, you know, could, you could argue. So anyway, so the difference here is that instead of only having a single-headed arrow pointing to the right we have a double-headed arrow pointing both ways. In other words, A plus B can go together to make C plus D <clears throat> in our example here, or the opposite can happen. So this is referred to as an equilibrium. So it's different from kinetics in chapter 14. And one of the ways it's different is that, remember in chapter 14, you, you cannot look at a reaction and determine its order or its like, you can't write the rate law just by looking at it. Now, hopefully you remember that by now. We'll see that when we have equilibrium, <clears throat> then we have a different situation, and it turns out that you actually can look, can look at it and write the equilibrium expression. And that's what we're going to do right now. So uh, I've gone through a few uh, explanations here. We, <clears throat> we can say that the rate of this equilibrium is either the rate forward or the rate in reverse. If it's at equilibrium, they should be equal to each other. 
So this rate going in the forward direction <clears throat> at equilibrium should be equal to the rate going in the reverse direction. So to write the rate law for the forward direction, we write that uh, rate is some rate constant k times the concentration of A to some power times the concentration of B to some power. And then to do it in the other direction, we would just do the opposite. So we would say the rate is rate, some rate constant k times c times d. At equilibrium, though, <clears throat> they should be equal. So we can write these as being equal to each other and then rearrange these to get kf divided by kr, where these are rate constants like we were dealing with in chapter 14. Well, now we have two of them, and one's divided by the other one. So we're just going to rewrite these two as one constant. We'll write it as a capital K. So when you see capital K, uh, you <clears throat> want to remember that that means it's an equilibrium constant. So the rate constants for regular reactions, like in chapter 14, are written with a lowercase k, and equilibrium constants are written with a capital K. And there are a lot of equilibrium constants. And they have <clears throat> their own specific uses. So the one that we're talking about right now, uh, because there are several of them, I, th I think there are like six of them, we're going to call this one K sub C, where the C stands for concentration. Because we're dealing with concentrations here. <clears throat> uh, so uh, anyway, <clears throat> so what we wind up with is products of reactants. And they're raised to their respective powers. So here, there aren't any numbers written. So go back up to the top here. There's no there's no number in front of the A. So we just assume it's 1, right? Same for B, C, and D. <clears throat> so we're going to just go ahead and raise these to the first power. And we could not do that in Chapter 14. But since this is not the same thing as Chapter 14, because now we're not dealing with just rate laws for one-way reactions. We're dealing with equilibria. <clears throat> It turns out that we can just look at the coefficients, but don't get it mixed up. This is only for chapter 15 for equilibrium. So in this case, because everything is a 1 here in, in the actual equilibrium, then the exponents will be 1 also. So your k, will, and what we do is we call this the equilibrium constant expression where the k here is the equilibrium constant and this stuff over here is called the equilibrium constant expression and it's going to be c times d over a times b okay uh, if there were a 2 in front of the c here then you would have to raise the concentration of c down here to the second power okay all right so let's go to the next slide so again, I've rewritten this. So Kc, where the C is for concentration, is the products over the reactants. C times D raised to their respective coefficients, which are 1 here, uh, over A times B. So we call this part of it right here the equilibrium constant expression. And we call this part right here the equilibrium constant. OK, next slide. So if this constant is large, that means there's more products than reactants. If it's small, that means there's more reactants than products. Remember we're at, remember we're at equilibrium here. So what that means is that if you have a large K, that means that this equilibrium wound up shifting mostly to the right. <clears throat> In other words, it went mostly to products. Again, that's because you've got a ratio of products over reactants. On the other hand, if uh, k is small, it means that it doesn't go very far to the right. So the reaction remains mostly on the reactant side and just a little bit of it reacts. Uh, okay, next slide. So equilibrium, as we said, if you look at it macroscopically from our viewpoint, it looks like nothing's changing. But we know that if we could look at it under a microscope, then we would see all kinds of activity because you've got all kinds of products going to reactants and vice versa. It's just that they're going at the same rate. Uh, next. So if we look at the way these things go in terms of a graph, uh, we if we look at this reaction right here, which we're going to look at over and over again, um, <clears throat> so we have N2 plus 3H2 is 2NH3. This is the Haber process. It may already be familiar to you, and if it isn't, then it probably will be soon. Uh, 
So we have two reactants here. We have N2 and H2. So if you look here, here's the H2, the green line, and here is the N2, which is the blue line. Um, so you see here that we started off with higher concentrations of these two reactants, and they started to go down <clears throat> because we're using them up when we make the product, which is NH3. And you'll want to remember the name for NH3. It's ammonia. Uh, so uh, what happens with the ammonia? Well, when we first start off, we don't have any of it. And that's going to be typical of most of the problems we do. We're going to always assume, unless we're told otherwise, that we're starting off with the no product. So we're going to assume that here. So we're going to start off here with zero uh, for the concentration of NH3, and then it will increase. And at some point, it will level off, and it will stay constant. Same thing happens for the two reactants, if you'll notice. Every, everything, once you get past this dotted line here, as time goes on, the H2 concentration stays constant, the N2 concentration stays constant, and the NH3 concentration stays constant. So that means you're at equilibrium. So when you do a problem that's at equilibrium, you can set up your expression and solve that problem, where you say that the equilibrium constant equals the ratio of the products of the concentration uh, of the concentrations of the products over the concentration of the reactants raised to the power of their coefficients. However, you can only only do that if you are at equilibrium. So what happens if you're not at equilibrium? Well, you can't set these two things equal. You can do something with what you have if you're not at equilibrium. And we call that something, um, well, the solubility product is what we're going to call it later, or the reaction quotient is what we, we call it now. So we have like two or three different names we're going to call it by the time the semester is over. And it's abbreviated as a Q. And uh, the only difference between the Q and the K, and we'll talk more about that later, is that the Q is not necessarily at equilibrium. So therefore, you cannot say Q equals uh, I mean, you can say that it equals the, the ratio of the, of the products over the reactants at some specific time. <clears throat> However, you cannot set it equal to the equilibrium constant. So we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but So the point I'm trying to make here is that you can only do these problems with the equilibrium constant if you're at equilibrium. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So equilibrium is reached when the concentrations reach levels at which the rates are equal. It's going just at the same rate forward as it is in reverse. Next slide. Here's another way of looking at that where we just, here's the forward rate, which starts off high and drops until it levels off. And here's the reverse rate, which starts off at zero and then picks up until it levels off. And when they both level off, notice here, they're both at the same level. Next slide. Here's an equilibrium. We have a closed vessel reacting according to the equation H2O plus CO gives H2 plus CO2. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is what would happen if we mess this equilibrium up. So let's say, for example, that we add more H2O to it. We mess up, so everything's all balanced. The rates are going the same in both directions. Now we mess it up, so we're going to add H2O to it. What happens to the concentrations? Well, when we first add the H2O, the concentration of the H2O is going to go up. But then it's going to start to come back down, but it won't come back down to the level it was originally. And the reason it'll come back down is because some of it's going to react with some of this CO here. And that's going to cause the CO's concentration to decrease. And then when it reacts with the CO, that will cause this concentration and this concentration, the CO2, to increase. So both of these are going to increase. So the result here is H2O's concentration goes up and then comes back down a little bit. CO's just goes down. And then both the H2 and CO2 concentration go up. So we're going to talk about this later, but this is called Le Chatelier's principle. And what it says is that if you have a system that's at equilibrium, then if you mess it up, and that's not the term that's usually used, but uh, then it will have to come to a new equilibrium. So the new equilibrium here would involve more H2, more CO2, more H2O, and less CO. So those two things where you started and where you finished are called equilibrium positions.
But notice that the constant, K, capital K, won't change. The only time, and you want to remember this, the only time that capital K changes is if you change the temperature. And that's also true of the K that we talked about in chapter 14, the rate constant. Otherwise, it stays the same. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So here are the results of what we just talked about. Let's go to the next slide because we've already dealt with this. Uh, all right, and now we have the same situation, the same reaction or equilibrium. And by the way, these can be called either reactions or equilibria. And equilibria is the plural of equilibrium. Uh, so now we're going to start off and we're at equilibrium, and now we're going to add some more H2. So it's going to do the same thing it did over there in the previous problem. It's going to go up. The H2 is going to go up and then come back down. The CO2 is just going to go down because some of it's going to react with the H2 that you added. And then both of the reactants in this case are going to go up. So you'll have a new equilibrium. If, if you leave it alone long enough, it will come to a new equili equilibrium, which will be a different equilibrium position than the original one. And then let's go to the next slide. And here are the answers. Let's go to the next slide. So for any equilibrium, as they've got it written here at the top, we can write the equilibrium expression for this by saying it's products over reactants, and that's going to equal K. So K equals C to the L power times M to the D power, or, sorry, got it backwards, times D to the M power, uh, over A to the J power times, not plus, but times B to the K power. <clears throat> So this is the way you would write these expressions, and we'll have problems where we're going to actually do this. Next slide. Uh, another thing that's a little different about this chapter is that the equilibrium constants are just numbers. They're written without units because what we're going to do is assume that all of the things that are being divided by the other things on top have the same units. So therefore, everything unit-wise is just going to cancel each other out. So we're going to leave the constant as just a number. Next slide. All right, so there was an old law of mass action that was written by, I think it was a couple of Norwegian chemists back in the 1800s. And what it says is basically what we've just been saying, that a rate of any chemical reaction would be pro proportional to the product of the masses here of the reaction substance, reacting substances with each mass raised to a power equal to the coefficient that occurs in the chemical reaction. So this is very similar to what we have just been talking about. Uh, we've just refined it a little bit. Notice here that they're talking about the products of the masses here, <clears throat> where we're talking about concentrations. Next slide. All right, now let's go back to what we said before. Remember, we had A plus B gives C plus D. So we originally, we had the A plus B on this, the left side and the C plus D on the right side. So let's write it in reverse. So now we've got C plus D, double-headed arrow, A plus B. What are we going to do for our equilibrium constant? It turns out that, and you, you should actually like write this out, but, but let's just go ahead. I mean, I recommend that in addition to what I'm getting ready to show you, that you just write this out yourself. To, to get familiar with what, what's happening or how it works. <clears throat> but uh, so here, <clears throat> our forward rate will be the opposite of what it was before. It'll be KCD instead of KAB. Same thing for the reverse. So when we make our equilibrium expression, we're going to have products of reactants, but this time it's going to be AB over CD down here at the bottom. <clears throat> and then we're going to convert this to our K. But this is not going to be the, obviously, this is a different K, because the numbers won't be the same, right? <clears throat> so let's go to the next slide. So we're going to call this one KC, and it's going to turn out that it's going to just equal 1 over KC original. So we'll call this one KC prime. Uh, so the new one is going to be called KC prime, uh, and it will be the same thing as if you took the original one, and just divided one by that. So if you already know what the original KC is, then when you reverse the direction of the equilibrium by writing the A and the B on the right uh, and the C and the D on the left, then if you want to know what the new constant's value is, you can just take the reciprocal of the original K value. 
<clears throat> so that means you don't have to redo the whole problem. So oftentimes on this test that we have, uh, usually it's exam one, where we have this chapter, I'll give you a problem where either I'll let you do a problem where you figure out K, C, and then I'll tell you in the next problem, okay, now this is what you have, and it'll just be the reverse of what you had before. And the only way you can really do it is to go back to the previous problem and find the number. So for example, if we did it originally A, B going to C, D, and we got two, then if we flip flop it and we make it C, D going to A, B, then the constant will be one over two. So you don't have to do anything. You just take the reciprocal of the constant that you had before. And then notice here that it says the values of these two constants will be different. I mean, obviously. Um, so we have to specify the form of the balanced equation. In other words, what they mean by this is we have to say, is it A plus B gives C plus D or vice versa? Next slide. So conclusions about the equilibrium expression which we've already talked about the one here at the top, but we haven't talked about the next one. <clears throat> and there's one other one that isn't listed here that I'll go ahead and tell you at this point. So number one, we've just talked about it. If we write the equilibrium expression for a reaction that's written in reverse, then its constant will be the reciprocal of the original constant. So we've talked about that. So let's move on to number two. What number two is saying is if we multiplied through everything for example, in the A plus B gives C plus D, if we changed it by multiplying through by 2, we would have 2A plus 2B gives 2C plus 2D. And that would not double the constant. It would cause the original constant to go up to the power of 2, or by the power of 2. In other words, if the original constant was 3, uh, which I know we said it was two before, but if I use that again, it, it won't work cor correctly. I mean, it'll work, but it'll it'll be ambiguous. So let's use three. <clears throat> so originally, uh, let's say our constant for a plus b gives c plus d was three. Then if we multiply through everything by two to get six and six and six and six, the constant will be three to the two power. So you <clears throat> raise the constant to the power of the number that you multiplied through. Uh, so three to the two power would be nine, not six. So what I'm saying is you don't multiply the constant by two. You multiply everything in the, in the reaction by two, but you square <clears throat> the constant. If you multiply through by one half, you don't then multiply one half times the constant. You raise the constant to the one half power. So changing it again. If it was originally k equals 4, and then you multiply through everything in the reaction by 1 half, then the new k will be the square root of 4 or 4 raised to the 1 half power, which is 2. And then there's another rule here that isn't listed, but we'll get to it eventually. And that is that if you add two equilibria together, then you don't add the constants, you multiply. So for example, if you have equilibrium A that has a constant of two, and you have equilibrium B that has a constant of three, and then you add A to B, you're gonna get a constant of three times two, which is six, not three plus two, which is five. We'll get to that later. Next slide. So each set of equilibrium concentrations is called an equilibrium position. Uh, the equilibrium constant will stay constant. That's why it's called a constant. The only way you can change it is if you change the temperature. So we uh, just uh, acknowledge that changing a temperature will mean the constant also has to change because constants are temperature dependent. Next slide. <clears throat> so at a given temperature, there's only gonna be one constant. Here, that's what this top paragraph is saying. Uh, but there could be many equilibrium positions. It depends on what the various concentrations are. So the equilibrium position will depend on the concentrations, but the constant doesn't. <clears throat> so what does the constant depend on? So think back about what we just said. Uh, next slide. All right, so what we've been talking about up to this point is when we take the concentrations. 
and we find the equilibrium constant using concentrations. We call it Kc. But you remember I told you there were like six or seven different specialized constants. <clears throat> and then there's also just the constant where you just write k by itself because it isn't any of the above. It's just some constant that we're dealing with at the particular moment <clears throat> for a particular problem. Uh, but a lot of the problems we do will be able to classify these constants according to what they are dealing with. And so what we've been talking about so far is Kc. And that involves concentrations, obviously. But there's another way you can do them where if you know uh, pressures of, if they, so they'd obviously have to be gases, right? So if the, the reactants and the products are all gases, or if most of them are gases, uh, then you can do it by taking the pressures instead of the concentrations. And you do it exactly the same way you do it for concentrations, but you're doing it for pressures. And because you're doing it with pressures instead of concentrations, your numbers are going to be different. In other words, the Kc won't equal the Kp in many cases. It's possible that it could, but that has to be in a very special case. Uh, so K sub P, the P stands for pressures here. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, before we do, though, uh, they're actually related by a, uh, an equation where you have to multiply whatever Kc is. If you wanted to convert that to Kp, you could. And I'm not going to write it all out, but you would have to multiply it times RT raised to the delta n power. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. So I'm going to go ahead and wait on that. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, here's the Haber process yet again. We'll, we'll, we'll see it again before we're finished. And I always usually, I mean, I always try to check to make sure that this is balanced because <clears throat> one of the things they do is they write this without it being balanced. <clears throat> and then if you just go ahead and do the problem, you wind up wasting your time. But for this one, so notice here the concentration <clears throat> uh, equilibrium expression would be products of reactants, which would be the concentration of NH3 squared over the concentration of N2 times the concentration. And notice I said times, not plus, times the concentration of H2 raised to the third power, which is written right here. But because these are all gases, we could also write it the other way if we knew what the pressures of the gases were. So we could also write it as the pressure of the NH3 squared. <clears throat> and again, you do the same thing you do with this two here. You put squared here uh, over <clears throat> the pressure of the N2 times the pressure of the H2 to the third. And again, notice I said times the pressure, not plus. Okay. You say, well, why do you keep saying that? Well, because it's something that people keep messing up. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the next slide. So for this example, if we have these pressures, what we would do if we wanted to know what Kp is would be to take the pressure for the NH3, which is right here, and square it and then divide it by the pressure of the N2, which is here, and then divide it by the pressure of the H2 raised to the third power, which means you'd have to take 2.9 times 10 to the minus third and raise it to the third power. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, so here is where that is done for you. Um, all of the numbers from the previous slide were just uh, put in where uh, these various parentheses are. And after you do all the dividing and multiplying, you get 3.9, <coughs> excuse me, times 10 to the fourth. Next slide. So here is our equation. So if we know what Kc is here originally, we can convert it to Kp by multiplying it by this r, which in this case is the 0.0821, not the 8.3141, times the absolute temperature. And then that quantity is raised to the power of delta n, where delta n is where you take <clears throat> the sum of all the coefficients on the product side minus the sum of the coefficients on the uh, reactant side. And we'll see examples of this, so don't panic if you don't understand what I mean, because it's not difficult. Next slide. Um, all right, so here's an example. Uh, so look here on the right-hand side for products, we have two here, and that's all we have because we don't have any other products. On the left, we have a one there. So one plus three is four. So we have two on the right, 
and we have four on the left. So to do your delta n thing, and what I mean by that, let me just go down and underline it, this right here. To get that, you do, in this case, it would be 2 minus 4. So delta n here would be 2 minus 4. which is minus 2. Finally, <clears throat> okay, so it's minus 2. So you raise uh, 0.082 times whatever the temp is, which, and it has to be the absolute temp, so you have to add 273 here to 35 to get 308. <clears throat> Uh, so, first of all, you multiply the 0.082 times the 308, and whatever you get from that, <clears throat> you raise to the minus 2 power. And then multiply that times your original Kc, whatever that was, <clears throat> um, to get Kp. Now, in this case, we're going in the other direction, but it doesn't matter. So, in this case, you would rearrange the equation and substitute in what you do know. In this case, what we're trying to find is the Kc. So you would have to use the Kp that you know. You would have to do what we just said, multiply r times t, raise it to the minus 2 power, and then, let's see, divide the original Kp by whatever you get, and that will give you the Kc in this case, <clears throat> which turns out to be 2.5 times 10 to the 7th. Next slide. Homogeneous equilibria involve all in the same phase. All three things are in the same phase. Heterogeneous, next slide, <clears throat> when, is when you have more than one face. Like here, you've got a solid. Uh, here you have a solid, but here you have a gas. Uh, for this one, you have a liquid and a gas and a gas. <clears throat> okay, when you have a pure liquid or a pure solid, and I'm marking these down at the bottom here, they don't really have concentrations. So... There's really no way that you can write a concentration other than just to write a 1. And they don't change. I mean, the concentration of a solid won't change. You might take some away from it. Same thing for a liquid, but you're not changing its concentration. You really can't. So when you have one of those in your uh, equilibrium, and you're doing like, let's say, Kc, <clears throat> what you can do is you can either write it as 1, or you, you can just actually leave it completely out. Because whenever it's 1, uh, it's just going to be whatever else is in the equilibrium expression. So most of the time we're just going to leave it out. <clears throat> and we'll come back to that. I'll point that out to you as we go through these problems. Next slide. So um, the position of a heterogeneous equilibrium does not depend <clears throat> on, excuse me, on the amount of pure solid or liquid. Pure solid. Now, we don't consider solutions to be pure liquids, even though they're in water their solution so they can change in concentration i mean and they do all the time so for example let's come down here to this 2k clo2 giving 2k cl plus 302 <clears throat> um, so notice here we have a solid here and here so we've only got one thing out of all three of these that's going to be something we even worry about so you could write this is uh, k equals uh, well, they don't designate whether it's concentration. It's concentration down below, so let's just consider it concentration. So <clears throat> it would be Kc here, and I'm just going to put that in for clarification, <clears throat> would be the concentration of O2, and it's going to be raised to the third power. And then that would be multiplied by the concentration of KCl raised to the second power and divided by the concentration of KCl O3 to, uh, raised to the second power. But since these don't change, this is a solid and this is a solid, then you can either write this as 1 here to the second power divided by 1 to the third power, but it's just kind of a waste of time to do that, isn't it? So most of the time, in fact, I mean, I may occasionally do that just for grins, but uh, just to remind you that we're, that we're that's what we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you could do it that way, but these are just going to cancel out. So just uh, probably the best practice is just to leave them out completely and just write Kc equals O2 to the third power. Next slide. All right, so now talking about something called the extent of reaction. Uh, so a value of K, I'm just reading, much larger than 1 means that you're going to have mostly products. And we actually mentioned this before, right? 
and so that means the equilibrium is going to lie to the right and what they mean by that is it's mostly going to go to products or another way that you can say it is to say the reaction goes essentially to completion um, and then if it's extremely large we could maybe say that the reaction is basically irreversible. Now that would be a situation like rusting on your car where, um, I mean, theoretically, I suppose it's possible that you could get rust on your car and then the rust could, maybe you could figure out some way to run some electricity through it that would cause it to reverse the rusting process and turn back into iron. But I mean, unless you did something really like extraordinary, that's not gonna happen. So basically that would be a situation that would be irreversible. Next slide. On the other hand, if you have a very small value of K, then that means this system is mostly reactive. Or we could also say that the equilibrium is very far to the left. In other words, it's mostly reactants. In other words, the reaction really doesn't occur to any significant extent. However, we, we do care, even if it doesn't react very much, we still care about how much it does react. Next slide. All right, so here's the concept check. Uh, if the equilibrium lies to the right, the value for K would be what? High or low? So think about it for a minute, and let's go to the next question. If the equilibrium lies to the left, the value for K is low or high? And of course, the answer to the top one is the value will be more than one. You will have more products than reactants, basically. Now, that isn't actually an accurate way to say it, but I say it that way because it's just a very brief way to say it. If the equilibrium lies to the left, the value of K will be less than one. That's supposed to be a less than sign there. Let me try to fix it a little bit better. It, okay, so next slide. And this thing has decided to stop working now. Next. Next. Okay, my little thing that makes the slides move has decided as it usually does to stop working. Next slide. <clears throat> so that brings us naturally to the next thing, which is called the reaction quotient or Q. The reaction quotient, which we're going to come back to later in Chapter 17b and call it the ion product. It's the same thing. Uh, so this is abbreviated not as K capital, but as capital Q. And it's almost the same thing as the K, except it's not at equilibrium. So you do it the same way. You do products over reactants. If it turns out that your Q is less than your K, that means that you're below equilibrium, so you need to let it react some more. And then the opposite is also true. Next slide. All right, so let me just read a little bit of this. In order to gauge the progress of a reaction, we can use an indicator that is very much, as we said before, like K, or the equilibrium constant, which we call the reaction quotient. And you'll want to try to remember these names because they, they show up on exam questions. Uh, so uh, Q is used only when all the initial concentrations are non-zero. And uh, it, let's just go ahead and go on to the next slide because it'll be easier for you to see it. So if you happen to have a situation where Q in this uh, K are the same, then you're at equilibrium. But if Q is, for example, let's go to the bottom first. If Q is less than K, then that means that the system has to shift to the right. That means you're going to have more products and less reactants. If Q is greater than K, then you have to shift the whole system to the left if you want to get to equilibrium. And I'm just going to leave that there for a couple of seconds and let you look at that. <clears throat> so again, let me, let's just review what we just said. Q is uh, like calculated the same way K is. It's just that it's not necessarily at equilibrium. In fact, most of the time when you do calculate Q, it won't be at equilibrium. So what you're basically trying to do is figure out if you need to shift to the left or shift to the right in order to get to equilibrium. So don't forget about this Q thing. If, if we don't use it that much in this chapter, remember we're going to be coming back to it later. So next slide. All right, now let's go ahead and start doing some uh, equilibrium constants. So there's a few little exercises that we're going to do now. They're all related, so we need to remember the value we get here on this slide so that we can use it for the next several slides.
So what we're going to do is we're going to set up something where it's going to be like a table where we're going to write down, uh, why don't we just start actually right here, and I'll try to be compact with my writing, which is very difficult to do with this marker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down what we start with on all of these, and then I'm going to see what we end up with, but we need it to be at equilibrium in order to use the equilibrium constant. And that's actually what we're going to do first, is we're going to find the value for the equilibrium constant for this reaction by using the numbers that they give us. Okay, so when we start off, the Fe concentration is 6 molar, which I'm just going to write as 6, and the SCN is 10. And what are we going to put over here on the right-hand side? for the FESCN. Well, if they don't tell you anything more than what we have here, then you just put in zero. Now you say, wait a minute, it doesn't say zero. It says the FESCN is four. Right there, right? Well, yeah, that's true, but that's at equilibrium. But what we're doing right now is we're writing it down what it is at the beginning. So we're going to call that the initial or I. So uh, something changed here. We added something to the FESCN at some point. I'm going to draw another line here. And then I'm going to add what we started with and what the change was. So this uh, row is going to be the change row. And then down at the bottom is going to be what it winds up being at equilibrium. And for this thing over here on the right, the FESCN, this, we know that at equilibrium it wound up being 4. So if it started at 0 and ended up at 4, what would have had to have happened to it? In other words, what change would you have had to have done to it? And the answer is you would have had to have added 4. But because these coefficients are all 1s, then that means the stoichiometry here, here, and here are going to be or is going to be 1 to 1 to 1. In other words, what that means is if you add 4 on this side of the arrow here, if you add 4 to the right side, you have to subtract 4 from the left. And that applies to both things on the left. So I'm going to subtract 6 minus 4 for the Fe3+, plus, and that's going to leave me with what? It's what's 6 minus 4? 2. And what's 10 minus 4? 6. So my Fe3 plus concentration at equilibrium is 2, the SCN minus is 6, and the FESCN is 4. And all of those are equilibrium values, but that's what we need. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to set products over reactants equal to the equilibrium constant. We can't do that unless we're at equilibrium. So the constant is going to be 4, which is the only product we have raised to the first power, so just leave it as 4. And it's going to be divided by 2 times 6, and those are both at the first power. In other words, it's going to be 4 divided by 12, and that is going to be 0, well, it's going to be 1 third, right? Or, I mean, we could write it as also 0 0.333, where the 3s just keep repeating. <clears throat> so, I mean, let's stop after about 3 of those 3s. And that is going to equal the constant. That's the equilibrium constant for this reaction at this temperature. And that does not change unless they tell you we're going to change the temperature now, but they, but they won't do that. So let's go to the next slide, but we need to remember that number right there. Okay, so next slide. Uh, and this is just where we figured out K. So you can pause if you want and look at this. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So now we're going to do it again, but now we're starting out here with 10 here. So let's write these in, even though it takes forever. And we're starting out with 8 here. And what we want to do is figure out in 0 here. And we want to figure out how much we have to change it such that when we divide the equilibrium concentration of FESCN by these two multiplied together, we get 0.333. In other words, the constant is the same as it was before. Right. So in other words, we have to add the same number to the 0 for the FESCN as we take away from the Fe3 plus and the SCN minus. That has to be the same number all the way across. And when we uh, divide the equilibria 
uh, concentrations, we should get one third. So just by trial and error, let's just look at this for a minute. I'll let you look at it for a minute. See if you can come up with some uh, small whole number that we could take away or add from these things to get it to come out to one third. Okay, and so you can pause here. And because you can pause here and for the sake of time, uh, trying to keep these videos as short as I reasonably can. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the answer here, and the answer is going to be 4, if you haven't already figured that out. So if we add 4 here, we're going to have 0 plus 4 is 4, and then I'm not going to write the other ones all out. So we're at equilibrium here, so this is the row for equilibrium. We're going to have 4 for the product, and then over here we'll have 10 minus 4, which is 6, and here in the middle we'll have 8 minus 4, which is 4. Okay, so scratch that. Let's try this again. The answer is actually going to be 5, so I looked at that wrong. So apologies. So it would have to be 5. So 0 plus 5 is 5. 10 minus 5 is 5, and 8 minus 5 is 3. Okay, so my bad. So anyway, when you divide 5 by 5 times 3, which is 15, you get 1 third, which is what we want. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here is the answer. So uh, the answer is just 5. And again, we're just doing this by trial and error. In other words, we're trying to get it so that when we divide that number by these two numbers multiplied together, we get one-third. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right, now let's do it again. So we're starting off here with 6. We're going to subtract something from that. And we're starting off here with 6. We're going to subtract something from that. And we're going to start off here with 0 and add the same number to that. So, And we want it to come up to one-third again. And in this case, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, this is going to be 3 for the change. And when we add it together, we get 3 here. And then the other two are going to be 6 minus 3, which is going to leave both of them at 3. So we're going to wind up with 3 divided over here, divided by 3 times 3 over here, which is 9, which is 1 third. Next slide. And here is our answer. So the answer here is going to be 3. <clears throat> now what we're doing is we're trying to show that this is not a particularly efficient way to do this. And we're going to get to a better way to do it in a moment. We still have a few more of these to do. So let's go to the next slide. So we have three more of these to do. So again, since you can pause these at the various slides and just look at them at your leisure, I'm going to go ahead and just give you the answers to these. For the first one here, we would have to, and notice these, these are not starting at zero, but we would know that because they're actually telling us that. So for the first one here, we would need to add three here to the product, and then we would have to take away three from the first two. And that would give us one plus three, which is four, divided by six times two, which is 12, which is one third. Um, for the second one, uh, we start off with 3, 2, and 5. We actually have to take away minus 1 here. And that would drop that to 4. And then that would make this one go to 4. And this one would go to 3. And we'd end up with 4 divided by 12, which is 1 third. And then for the third one, if you just look at it, it's already correct. So we don't have to do anything. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, pause briefly on the following three slides. And if you want to look at this in more detail, you can. So next, so here's the answer to the first one, the next one, uh, next, and then the next one or the last one here, if I can get it to go. There we go. <clears throat> okay, for this one, you don't have to do anything. All right, but it turns out there's a more organized way to do these. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, next. All right, so here's another example where we can actually 
This actually we can kind of do the same way, um, <clears throat> but then we're going to get to another one in just a moment that we can't. So a two mole sample is uh, introduced into a one liter container. Now, I didn't really point this out before, but I will now. And that is that when we're doing that table, uh, and by the way, that table is called an ICE, ICE table, I-C-E, where the I stands for initial, the C stands for the change, and the E stands for equilibrium. Uh, when we're doing those tables, the numbers that we're writing in those squares are molarity or concentration. Now, later in the course, we'll do another kind of a table called the stoichiometry table, where we'll actually be writing numbers of moles in where we're going to be doing problems later that involve two parts. But for right now, mostly what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using ice tables and we're going to be putting molarities in there. So just before we even go any further, let's notice that we're putting two moles of ammonia into one liter. So think about what the molarity would be there that we would write in here. And here's our equation. Remember I told you that whenever they give us this one, this is the Haber process, but look at it and see if you think it's balanced. <clears throat> and if, you know, you just look at it at all, you're going to probably see it isn't. So we're going to have to balance this thing first. Uh, and so why don't we uh, just do that now at the very beginning? And we'll, so we'll start with balancing it and then we'll move forward from there. So if you want to pause it here now and see if you can balance it, that would be a good exercise. So anyway, if you do that, then you should wind up with a two here. And then you have two ends on both sides. And then you should end up with a three here so that you have six H's on both sides. Now it's balanced. OK, so let's go ahead and go on. At equilibrium, we have one mole of ammonia that remains. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to write this um, on this slide. I may have to go to the next slide. Let's just go to the next slide. Anyway, what we're supposed to do is find the value for K. And it turns out that we can actually do this in a fairly straightforward way. But let's go ahead and do it. Next slide. You may be able to hear my parakeets in the background. I, that's why I have to come out to my kitchen to do these. Because if I try to do them in my bedroom, the, I have three parakeets and three finches. And they'll just raise cane in there. And they just love making noise when I'm doing this. Uh, so I, you know, I get as far away from them as I can. I live in a kind of a small place. All right, anyway, first of all, we have to balance this equation. Um, and then uh, what we can do is we can come down here and make up our ice table, where, the, again, that's initial change in equilibrium. OK, uh, so what's the initial concentration? So the way that I usually do these problems is I make the things that are things that are going to be given to you in the problem statement bold in, in the chart, like here. Uh, they told us this number in the problem statement, as well as this one right here. So um, what I did was I just rewrote this equilibrium down here across the top of the table. So this is actually the first time we've actually done a special ice table. <clears throat> so what happens is that as we go through the course, one of the challenging parts of some of the problems is going to be to figure out what am I going to write across the top here. And also notice if we hadn't stopped to balance that equation, we'd get totally the wrong answer. So anyway, the things that were given in the problem statement are that we had two moles in one liter of volume. And at equilibrium, we had one mole left. So what can we deduce from that? Well, we can deduce that we lost one mole right here, where I'm trying to make a line. It has to be, because we started with two and ended up with one. So that has to be a minus one. But we don't have what we had before always. We don't have a one to one to one stoichiometry. It's now two to one to three. So for every two of these things that we lose, we only lose one, or sorry, we only gain one here. And then for every two that we lose over here, we gain three over here. So we have to multiply the one over here by a half to get the N2 value. So it's just one half of one is a half. And we write that right here. And then because we're in this particular reaction, and most of the time it will be this way, where 
everything on the left hand side of the arrow is going to be minus because you're usually going to be losing from that side <clears throat> and I can't really think of any particular there, there's maybe one or two examples of problems later that we'll do in the semester where it's the opposite um, and then of course one of the ones I mean just to be you know, complete one of the ones that we just did a minute ago where we were guessing one of those we were actually going in the opposite direction if you'll recall uh, but anyway, in this one and most of them, almost all of them, we're going to have minus on the left of the arrow and everything on the right of the arrow will be plus. So you want to multiply the 1 here by 1 half to get the number for the N2 and by 3 halves to get the number for the H2. Okay. So if the change in the NH3 is minus 1, the change in the N2 has to be plus one half. Again, because of the relationship between the coefficients here and here. For every two of the NH3s, we're only get, going to get one of the N2s. So if we have one lost of the NH3s, then we'll only get one half of one of the N2. And then we'll get three halves of one for the H2. And so then once you have those numbers, uh, notice here that we're starting at 0 here and 0 here, and that's because they didn't tell us anything different. So we assume for the products that we don't have any at the beginning. So when you add 0 plus a half, you get a half. And when you add 0 to 3 halves, you get 3 halves. And your equilibrium expression is going to be 1.5 here, which is this number here, raised to the third power times this number here raised to the first power because there's a one here and then that's divided by one raised to the second power over here the one here but one raised to the second power is one and one in, into anything it's not going to change what's on top uh, so basically it's your answer is just going to be what you have right here so uh, 0.5 raised to the first power times 1.5 raised to the third power which is 1.68, and that is going to be your answer. Now, again, this one wasn't really a big deal. We just had to do some what, what's called deduction here. We had to uh, f like fill in the blank here by saying, okay, if we started with 2 and ended up with 1, then what had to happen to make that occur? Well, what had to happen is you had to subtract 1 here, but that means if you subtracted 1 here, you had to add a half here, and add three halves here. All right, so now next we're going to do a problem where we can't even do this because we can't get the numbers all filled out in our chart. So what do you think we're going to have to do to solve that kind of a problem? So think back to algebra. What variable did you put in if you couldn't figure something out and you had to figure it out algebraically? And the answer is x if you only had one variable or if you had two variables you'd usually use x and y and so forth so let's go to the next slide okay so here we have another concept check where we have a one mole sample of n2o4 gas placed in a 10 liter vessel so we'll stop here for a moment and figure out what is our molarity going to be if we have one mole in 10 liters so think about that for a moment and you should get 0 0.1 molar, one-tenth of a mole per liter. Uh, here's our equilibrium where we have N2O4 for the reactant and NO2, and there's two of them for the products or product, and then the K value is given to us. So the K value is given to us, and we know the expression already, right? And if you want, you could, and I recommend that you do this, you could just go ahead and write it out. Uh, it is going to be uh, that K equals NO2 squared, uh, which would be the concentration of NO2 squared, divided by the concentration of N2O4. And we don't have any pure liquids or pure solids, so we don't have anything vanishing. And then that's going to equal K, which in this case is 4E minus 4. So we're supposed to find the, the concentrations of the reactant and product at equilibrium. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So here's how we'll set this up. But notice we only know one thing from the problem statement as far as our chart. Uh, 
is concerned, and that's that 0 0.1 where we have one mole in 10 liters. We don't know anything else, and we can't figure it out. We can't deduce it. All we know is at the end of the day, if we take this concentration right here and square it and divide it by this concentration right here, we're supposed to get 4 times 10 to the minus 4. But there's no way to solve this like we did the previous problem because we can't figure out the other numbers. Now, we can go ahead and assume that the concentration at the beginning here is going to be zero. But that doesn't really help us any because we don't know what either equilibrium uh, concentration is because they didn't tell us what they were. So here's what we have to do. We have to substitute in x to put what the amount would be in terms of a variable, and then we have to solve for x. So on the left-hand side, we have a 1. On the right-hand side, we have a 2. So every time we lose one thing from the left side, we have to gain two things on the right. So if usually the way we do it is we just put minus x on the left, <clears throat> and then on the right, we would have to put plus 2x, because for every one of these, we have to have two of these, right? So uh, on the right, then, what we end up with is 0 plus 2x, which is 2x, um, which that quantity will still have to be squared because when we put it into the equilibrium ex expression, that 2x that we just wrote right there is representing what the concentration would be. But that concentration then has to be squared. So we're going to wind up with 2x squared. And on the left, we're going to have 0.1. So it would be 0.1 minus x, which is 0.1 minus x. Now, we're going to use a shortcut later. But for right now, let's just go ahead and leave it the way it is. So what we're going to end up with is that the k is going to be this value here squared, which is down here. So it's 2x quantity squared, which would be 2 squared times x squared, which would be 4x squared, divided by <clears throat> 0 0.1 minus x. And that will equal the constant, which they told us was 4e minus 4. And that doesn't have units. It's a constant. So if you cross multiply here and gather your terms, do some algebra, you end up eventually with this. If you get everything on the left-hand side and leave the right-hand side as 0, you get 4x squared plus 0.0004x minus 0.0004 equals 0. Uh, so you may recognize this if you don't. This is called a quadratic equation. And you can solve these online by going to certain websites or uh, some calculators allow you to solve them. Mine doesn't, but some do. And the way that you solve this, and there's also a formula, and I'll show you the formula on the next slide, uh, which you can also use the formula and just do it manually. <laughs> and when you use the formula, which is the way it would be done with the calculator and the website as well, you get two answers, which they call the answers roots, R-O-O-T-S. And so usually one will be positive and one negative. And so you'll have to look at the problem to see which one makes sense. You want to get rid of one of the roots. Uh, and it's usually not difficult to figure out which one to get rid of. <clears throat> All right, so it turns out that if we do this quadratic equation, and again, the formula is on the next slide. It's minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Uh, <clears throat> but we're not really going to be using it very much, if at all. So that's uh, I'm just going to wait and show it to you in a moment. If we did that, we get two roots. And the one that we want to keep is this one. It's 0 0.00311. So let's go to the next slide now and look at the formula, which is here. This is how you would do it if you wanted to do it manually. The idea is, though, that we're, we're not teaching you algebra here. So we're going to try to do a shortcut where we can avoid most of the time having to use this thing. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> whenever we uh, figured out what x was, it was 0.00311, and what you would have to have done would have been to look back at the chart and see that the N204, which was our reactant, was 0.1 minus X. So to get the concentration of that, you would have to take 0.1 what, minus what you got when you solve for X, which was 
0.00311. And so the concentration would be 0.0969. <clears throat> Uh, and then over on the product side, the NO2 concentration wound up being 2x, right? And if you don't remember that, you might want to just take a moment and pause the video and go back a slide or two and look at that chart that we had set up. The, the NO2 was the product, and it was on the right, and at the bottom right, we got 2x, right, algebraically. And then when we figured out what x was, which is 0 0.003 roughly, <clears throat> Then to get the concentration of the NO2 here, we just multiply 2 times that number, and we get 0 0.00622. Next slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a little trick here. And whenever x is small compared to the number that it's being subtracted from, <clears throat> then we're going to just neglect it. So let's go to the next slide. So here is the rule. And basically what it's saying, and I'll kind of go ahead and add to this a little bit, is that we're always going to do this. And so whenever we have a situation where we get like 0.1 minus x, we're just going to forget about the x. And that way that removes the necessity for us to have to use the quadratic equation. <clears throat> so uh, the rule is that if you do that and then you go back and you check your error, and the way you check your error is to compare what you get for x uh, with the original value that you subtracted it from, the rule is that if that's 5% or less, and you don't know what I'm talking about right now, but you will in, in, in a little while when we start to do some of these other problems. <clears throat> if you divide and you get 5% or less, in other words, 0.05 or less, then we're going to say it's okay. We're just going to live with it. Now, let me just say two more things. There's going to be a few problems that are going to give us answers that uh, we, where we, if we neglect X, as we're talking about here, that they're going to give us answers with errors that are greater than 5%, and we're just not going to worry about it. Like I think some of them are even as much as over 10%. Uh, a couple of those are because the problems are already so difficult uh, that to try to go back and do it over again using the quadratic equation would just be too much. <clears throat> so really, most of the time, I mean, I think for the last several semesters, I haven't asked anyone to do a quadratic equation other than I think on a bonus question, well, I'm sure. Uh, so there was one bonus question I gave a couple of semesters ago, and then also the semester before that, where you had to use the quadratic equation. But that was just for the bonus question, but there were no uh, questions on the actual test where you had to do that. And then there's another thing which I'm just going to point out very briefly, just so you'll understand this. Uh, sometimes when we say we get this error, what we mean is we go back and we divide what we got for the X by the original concentration of the reactant. Like if it was, if it was originally 0.1, uh, then if we got an X of like 0.001, then that would be 1 one hundredth or 0.01, which would be 1% error. <clears throat> So let's just take the case that we do a problem and we do the best we can, but we neglect the X. And let's say we get an 18% error. Well, okay, yeah, it's more than 5%. So let's go back and do it all over again and use the quadratic equation. What you're going to discover is even if you do that, you're going to still have an error of about probably 17%. So it's not like you're going to get it all the way down to, to a perfect number. Uh, then it still will be a, a large error because some problems you just can't solve to uh, like within like one percent because of the way they're constructed. The way it basically works is the smaller the original concentration is, the harder it is to get it down to a very low error. And also the larger the x is. In other words, the larger the x or the smaller the th thing that you're dividing. Uh, in other words, the, the smaller the original concentration of the reactant, then the harder it's going to be to get these errors down. So all I'm saying here, and you might just consider it, is that it doesn't make any difference if you use the quadratic equation or not. You're still not going to be able to get it any. You'll be able to get it a little bit closer, but not very much closer. So you have to ask yourself the question, is it even worth it? So having said that, let's go ahead and move on. <clears throat> And let's also go ahead and move on to the next one here. So if notice here, if we used our alternate method of solving that previous problem, it would have saved us from having 
to use the quadratic equation, where we're just changing the point 0.1 minus x here to point 0.1. And it turns out not to really make much of a difference at all. So what happens is if we actually do it this way, we get x is 0 0.00031623. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and we see here that when we used the quadratic equation, we got 0 0.00311. When we didn't, when we just uh, simplified it, we got 0 0.00316 uh, which was a difference of about 1.7%. And so what we do is we just accept that uh, and we do it because it's so much easier if we don't have to worry with this quadratic equation. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Le Chatelier's principle is what we talked about also at the beginning of this slide set where we said that if you have an equilibrium, then it will just stay at equilibrium. And, but if you come along later and mess it up, then it has to reestablish a new equilibrium. And you may remember a couple of problems we did at the beginning of the slide set where, for example, we may have added a product or we may have added a reactant. And we want to see what happens to the equilibrium when we did that. <clears throat> That's called the Chatelier's principle. Let's go to the next slide. So Le Chatelier's principle says if a change is imposed on a system at equilibrium, the position of the equilibrium will shift in a direction that tends to reduce the stress. Next slide. Uh, so there are four different things. I think I believe there are four things we're going to look at here, of which two are basically the same thing. And it turns out here we're going to do concentration first, but we've already actually done that. Remember when we had the reactions and we said, okay, let's add a reactant like water or we'll add a product like H2 uh, and see what happens. Well, when we did that, we were actually doing this. We were actually changing the concentrations. And so the rule is if you add a reactant, it shifts the equilibrium to the right. And contrary wise, if you add a product, it shifts the equilibrium back to the left. And we've already seen that. Uh, and then there's a discussion here about wh what happens with Q here, which we don't really need to get into. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and here we're just saying the same thing I just said. If you add a product, it's going to shift the whole equilibrium to the left. Now, before we go any further, we're going to talk also about volume and temperature. But before we do that, we're going to also at the end of this talk about pressure. So what you'll want to remember for pressure is this. Remember, we said that we can either do these kinds of problems using the concentration or we can do them using the pressure and they both work, right? So if you're talking about increasing the pressure of one of the reactants or products or decreasing them, you're, you're basically doing the same thing that you do when you change the concentration, right? So if you increase the pressure, for example, of a reactant, then you're going to shift it to the right. If you increase the pressure of one of the products, then you're going to shift the equilibrium to the left. The only uh, other possibility would be if you add another gas that isn't involved in the reaction. Like, for example, if you added for some reason an inert gas or a noble gas like argon or krypton, which might happen occasionally, <clears throat> it won't have any effect. And that's because it isn't involved at all in the reaction. Okay, let's move on now and talk about temperature and then volume and we'll be done. So for temperature, we first of all have to know whether the reaction that we're dealing with is endothermic or exothermic. And I've put a couple of extra slides here, which I'll pause on it. And then if you want to pause on them and read them, you can. I lifted these and I, I gave proper credit, but I lifted them off the net to maybe help you a little bit to understand this if you don't get what I'm getting ready to say. But what we can do is we, we can, first of all, we need to determine, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? Uh, if it's endothermic, we're going to just say that heat is one of the reactants because we have to actually put heat into it to make it go forward. So let's just write heat on the left-hand side. And if it's exothermic, then we can say that heat is, but I'm not going to write both of them in this same reaction, but 
So here's our double-headed arrow. So if it's endothermic, it will be like the one I just wrote, where heat would be one of the reactants. And then you would also have plus A, plus B, plus C, or whatever, which I'm only going to write one of those. So let's just say write A here. And those are your two reactants. But, I mean, really the heat isn't really a reactant, but we're considering it to be a reactant. So what that means is that if it's an endothermic a a reaction and you add heat to it, it's just like if you added a reactant. In other words, if you add heat, and the way that they usually phrase that is by saying that you increase the temperature, it's the same thing, right? Then you're adding a reactant, and that's going to shift the reaction or the equilibrium to the right. Okay, so let's take the contrary scenario where we have an exothermic reaction. And let's put that down here so we don't get them mixed up. So here I've got some reactants on the left, and I've got my double-headed arrow. And then I've, let's just say I've got C here <clears throat> that we're producing. If it's exothermic, then I would just go ahead and recommend that you write heat in here. So just go ahead and write plus heat because heat is a product if it's exothermic. And that being the case, if you increase the temperature, it's like increasing the concentration of a product, right? You're adding heat, and that's going to shift the whole equilibrium back to the left. Okay, so that's how endothermic and exothermic reactions work. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this slide and then the following two slides are in here for your uh enjoyment if you want to read these on your own. So I'll pause it here for a moment and go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. So you can pause these if you want. Otherwise, let's go on. <clears throat> Pressure we've already talked about. Uh, I'll just repeat what I said about the inert gases. If you add an inert gas like argon or krypton, one of the things in the eighth column, it will not affect the equilibrium. And then the last slide deals with volume and the rule for this is that if you decrease the volume, the equilibrium will shift, like for example here, would shift to the right. Because you have two molecules on the right and you have a total of three plus one, which is four on the left. So if you decrease the volume, there isn't as much room for these things to exist in. So they will move to the side that has the fewest number of molecules, which in this case would be over on the right hand side. If you increase the volume, they're going to move from this side over to this side because you've got more room, so you're going to spread out more and allow more of these things to be in the form of N2 plus 3H2. And that's the rule for that. Okay, and I believe that brings us to the end of this chapter. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and next, and we are indeed finished. So we'll go on now to the work problems for chapter 15. So I'll see you there.